If it erupts, it could be the most significant conflict in the South Caucasus since the 1990s. A war that will shatter old power dynamics and permanently alter the ethnic landscape of this starkly beautiful region. For the past year, tensions between neighboring Armenia and Azerbaijan have been at a boiling point. Following a two-day war in September of 2022, the bitter rivals have remained on the brink of a wider conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh, a self-governing enclave within Azerbaijan's internationally recognized territory. Home to around 120,000 ethnic Armenians, Nagorno-Karabakh was the site of a brutal war in the 1990s. Closer to our time today, six weeks of fighting in 2020 killed up to 7,000. In short, it's a place with a deeply troubled history. A history, the bloodiest chapter of which might be about to be written. As the fall of 2023 gets underway, Nagorno-Karabakh is under a devastating blockade. While recent negotiations may yet bring some relief, they've been accompanied by troop buildups. Buildups that could be a bluff or could herald the coming of another devastating war. In a world roiled by humanitarian crises from Ukraine to Yemen to Haiti, it's perhaps no surprise that one might slip under the radar. But make no mistake about it, the suffering being experienced by those in Nagorno-Karabakh could rank up there with the populations of many better-known trouble spots. Right now, the 2,700 square kilometers of territory controlled by the separatist government is suffering crippling shortages. Food has vanished from supermarket shelves. Medicines to treat chronic illnesses have become a mere memory. Fuel stocks have run so low that the public transport system has imploded. While those villagers who grow their own crops and have their own wells are able to still eke out an existence, those in the capital of Stepanakert are without water and electricity. Unemployment is absolutely sky high. Amid such misery, health problems are taking hold. Deaths among toddlers and the elderly are higher than usual, while miscarriages are at three times their average level. Yet, while the citizens of Nagorno-Karabakh, known locally as the Republic of Artsakh, may be suffering deprivations similar to those in Haiti or Ukraine, where they differ is the cause. Because it's not state collapse or full-blown war that is causing them such misery. Rather, it's a blockade. A blockade that sealed off their home as effectively as placing it under a dome. A blockade that's being enforced by the nation that Nagorno-Karabakh is technically a part of, Azerbaijan. Now, before we get onto the specifics of that blockade, we do need to take the briefest of pauses here to explain what Nagorno-Karabakh is and why Azerbaijan might want to blockade it. At its simplest, the region is a slice of bleakly beautiful mountainous land in the west of Azerbaijan. The first part of its name, Nagorno, literally means mountainous. Once home to 120,000 ethnic Armenians, it is today populated by a smaller number who control about 2,700 square kilometers of its 4,400 square kilometer area. Around half of them live in the main city of Stepanakert, which they consider the capital of their independent republic. Crucially, though, the international community does not recognize their independence. Even Armenia today accepts Nagorno-Karabakh lies within Azerbaijan's borders. And that is a massive problem, because the people of Nagorno-Karabakh believe the Azeri government wants to cleanse them from the land, to turn them into refugees and repopulate the region with their own people. Its narrative, the blockade, is more than playing into. Go back in time, just a single year, and Nagorno-Karabakh was a well-stocked place with regular shops like you might find on any corner of the South Caucasus. Every day, 400 tons of food arrived on trucks from Armenia, shipped along a narrow road connecting Nagorno-Karabakh to the mothership like an umbilical cord. A road of life known as the Lachin Corridor. Now, traversing the corridor was always a little nerve-wracking. With the heights around it occupied by Azeri soldiers, it felt like a geopolitical trouble spot. But it was only last December 2022 that the Azeris came down from the peaks to sever that cord. With the lacking corridor blocked, Baku was able to control what went in and what went out of Nagorno-Karabakh. Instead of food trucks, only Red Cross vehicles were allowed in. Instead of families traveling to Armenia, only pre-approved ambulances could get out. For a while, the blockaded region limped on, surviving on sharply reduced supplies. But then came June the 14th of this year, 2023. While the wider world was getting ready for a relaxing summer, Azeri and Armenian forces skirmished at the border. 
In the immediate aftermath, Azerbaijan completely shut the Lakin Corridor. With that, Nagorno-Karabakh's residents were severed from the outside world. And since then, the situation under these clear mountainous skies has sharply deteriorated. With starvation on the horizon, some, including a former international criminal court prosecutor, have claimed Baku may be conducting a genocide. Now, obviously, that's not how Azerbaijan sees it. When discussing the Lakin Corridor, Azeri officials prefer to point to the illegal arms shipments they say were being sent to the 5,000 Armenian soldiers in Nagorno-Karabakh, shipments the blockade is meant to disrupt. They also dispute the idea that the region is even under blockade. Since June, Baku has repeatedly offered to ship supplies from the Azeri city. The fact Nagorno-Karabakh's people have refused this, in their eyes, means the Armenians only have themselves to blame. To which one Nagorno-Karabakh official memorably responded on Twitter, What would you do if a terrorist blocks your access to a water wellspring in a desert, tortures you for a while, then offers you his urine to drink? It's in moments like these that the intractability of the crisis becomes clear. The dueling fears on both sides. With the Azeris worried about arms shipments, while the Armenians fear Azeri aid that, as one interview told The Guardian, they believe might be poisoned. How did it get to this stage? How did these two communities get to the point where mistrust runs so toxically deep? Well, as usual in these situations, the answer lies in a long and bitter history of violence. The Caucasus expert and journalist Thomas DeWall memorably wrote that the violence surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh was, to quote, a conflict whose levels of complication go as deep as those of Cyprus, Kashmir, and Jerusalem. And that wasn't hyperbole. The roots of hatred in this land are old, they are twisted, and they are sunken so deep that following them back to their start point can feel just like a total impossibility. But we can at least take a stab at excavating the origins of the current crisis, the ethnic tensions that came spilling over with the collapse of the Soviet Union. During the glory days of the USSR, leaders were stuck with a conundrum. On the one hand, their communist utopia was meant to be a society of workers, all united across ethnic and linguistic boundaries. On the other hand, it turned out that a lot of those ethnicities were pretty big into holding on to their distinctiveness. This was a fact that was reflected in the USSR's structure as a collection of 15 separate republics divided along historic or ethnic lines. In such a vast nation, though, a mere 15 republics wasn't enough to contain its multitudes of people. So, each full-level republic might contain any number of smaller second-level republics, also known as ASSRs, along with a whole bunch of autonomous oblasts. For example, the Soviet Socialist Republic of Azerbaijan contained within its borders both the Nakhchivan ASSR and the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast. So long as the USSR was still standing, any differences between their peoples were kept from boiling over. The ASSRs and the Autonomous Oblasts had some slight control over their fates and well, if they didn't like it, there was always the gulag. The trouble came when the Soviet Union began to disintegrate, falling apart at the dawn of the 1990s like a vampire turning to dust. While everyone seemed to agree the 15 full republics, places like Ukraine, Estonia, and Kazakhstan, would now be independent countries, no one really seemed sure how to treat the smaller, autonomous parts. Some of them, like the Nachivian ASSR, were content to remain a part of these newly independent republics. Others, though, felt they had just as much of a right to be fully recognized nations. Most famously, this included Chechnya in Russia, but it also included Nagorno-Karabakh. And the violence began to flare as early as 1988, when the oblast demanded to be transferred from Azeri control and instead become a part of socialist Armenia. In Nagorno-Karabakh, ethnic Armenians attacked their Azeri neighbors. In Azerbaijan, pogroms drove thousands of Armenians from their homes. But it wouldn't be until the Soviet Union had collapsed that things got really bad. Kicking off in 1992, the first Nagorno-Karabakh war was like watching a depressing game show in which humans compete to show how utterly inhumane they can be. For over two years, atrocities, massacres, ethnic cleansing took place amid the ancient landscape. Perhaps 30,000 died. Hundreds of thousands of Armenians and Azeris alike were forced to flee their homes. By the time the dust had settled in 1994, the land had been stained with blood. Yet for the winning side, all that carnage was almost worth it. 
The war ended with a decisive Armenian victory. Not only had Yerevan secured Nagorno-Karabakh, it had also taken control of seven ethnically Azeri districts surrounding it, districts that were indisputably a part of Azerbaijan. For the Azeris, loss of the war was nothing less than a catastrophe. Over the years, the idea of a great return to cold, one that imagined an eventual reconquest of lost lands, in reality, though, there seemed to be little chance of that. Although backed by regional power Turkey, Azerbaijan was simply too weak to defeat Armenia. Especially after Yerevan joins the CSTO, a kind of Russian-led NATO, where an attack on one would be treated as an attack on all. With Moscow providing Yerevan's muscles, uh, there was nothing that Baku could do. Not that the Azeris didn't try. In 2016, they fought a four-day war with Armenia over Nagorno-Karabakh, a war that killed 200 and saw Baku retake 20 square kilometers of territory. There were also instances of cross-border shelling and drone attacks. By and large, though, it seems the conflict had been decided in the 1990s. Armenia had won, and that was that. Except it wasn't. Not really. Even as Yerevan grew to rely more and more on its security treaty with Moscow, Baku was buying TB2 drones from Turkey, splurging its growing oil wealth on new, advanced military tech that Armenia just couldn't match. Behind the scenes, too, Azerbaijan's strongman president, Ilham Aliyev, was growing personally closer to Vladimir Putin. At the same time, his backer, Turkish autocrat Erdogan, was becoming an ever more powerful counterweight to Russia. The result? By 2020, the balance of might had tilted far out of Armenia's favor. Not that Yerevan would realize, though, not until it was too late. On September the 27th, an all-out Azeri attack was launched along the front lines. What followed was the textbook definition of shock and awe. According to military analyst Rob Lee, to quote, Azerbaijan reportedly destroyed 60% of the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic's air defenses and 40% of its artillery in the first hour of the war. End quote. This was the start of the Second Nagorno-Karabakh War, a war that would last six weeks and kill up to 7,000 people. By the time it was over, the outcome of the 1990s conflict would have been almost totally reversed. In those six weeks of war, the amount of territory Armenia lost almost made protecting Nagorno-Karabakh untenable. Those seven districts in Azerbaijan that Yerevan had seized, they all fell to Baku's forces. In Nagorno-Karabakh itself, around 1,300 square kilometers of land were lost. This is how the Lacking Corridor came to be of such importance. With its buffer zone completely gone, Armenia was reduced to relying on a single road to connect it with Stepanakert. Had the war gone on any longer, it could have lost this vital lifeline too. That it didn't was due to a Moscow-brokered peace deal, one that allowed Azerbaijan to keep its gains but also resulted in 2,000 Russian peacekeepers being deployed to protect the Lacking Corridor. The assumption was that Baku would never dare to stand up to Russian troops. As visible symbols of Moscow's military might, the peacekeepers would ensure the fragile post-war settlement remained in place. In another universe, that's probably how things would have gone. In this other universe, the 2020 war was the last outbreak of violence in Nagorno-Karabakh, and the status quo has since held. But, well, that's not our universe, is it? In our universe, the illusion of Russian power evaporated. In our universe, Putin allowed his army to get so badly mauled in Ukraine that it can no longer effectively carry out peacekeeping missions. A fact that certainly didn't go unnoticed by President Ilham Aliyev of Azerbaijan. You can see this just by looking at the date when Azeri forces launched their next attack, September the 12th, 2022. For those in need of a refresher, September the 12th, 2022 was the culmination of Ukraine's Kharkiv offensive, the moment when Kiev took back 8,000 square kilometers of territory in a handful of days and Putin was forced to order a partial mobilization and, well, it briefly looked like Russian forces might collapse. While the Kremlin was panicking over Ukraine, Baku took another bite out of Nagorno-Karabakh. This time, Azeri forces even shelled villages inside Armenia's internationally recognized borders. Over 300 people were killed. Faced with attacks on Armenian territory proper, Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan took a drastic step. He activated the CSTO's Collective Defense Clause, you know, the one that was meant to make Russia come running to protect its ally. Instead, Putin just looked away a bit awkwardly and did absolutely nothing. And imagine for a second how humiliating it would be for America if a NATO ally like Britain was attacked, only for Joe Biden to respond not with force, but with uh, just mumbled excuses. 
No country on earth would ever fear US power again. Even Liechtenstein would probably be all like, <laughs> check out those weaklings. Well, what's true for Uncle Sam is true for Mother Russia. Witnessing Moscow's inability to stand up for its ally seems to have been a revelation for Baku. The aura around the Russian peacekeepers crumbled. Just three months later, the blockade of the Lachian Corridor began. As predicted, the Russian peacekeepers simply stood aside. Jump forward to today, and the effects of the blockade are visible for everyone to see. Now, to be clear, there is some debate as to whether it's actually still in effect. As we were working on this video, Baku and Yerevan both said that they'd reached an agreement to lift the blockade. As of September the 13th, though, the Lachian Corridor still appears to be impassable. Yet, even if the blockade really has been lifted, few think that it will be the end to the tensions surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh. The main reason? Azerbaijan sees no need to step back now. Thomas DeWall has written about how President Aliyev thinks he's on a roll, that the balance of power has tilted decisively in Azerbaijan's favor, and the Russian army has shown itself to be a paper bear. This is bad news for inhabitants of the breakaway region because Aliyev has been clear about what he expects from them. Complete integration into Azeri society. There will be no offers of autonomy. At best, they may be offered special language rights, but even that is uncertain. In this, Aliyev is backed by an Azeri public that feels no sympathy for the inhabitants of Nagorno-Karabakh. Ever since Azerbaijan recaptured the seven Armenian-occupied districts, champions of the Great Return have been publicizing what Armenian rule, according to them, really means. In these territories, images have emerged of towns in ruins and fields heavily mined. For Azeris, this is evidence that Armenian forces deliberately destroyed their homes during the occupation. Now the boot is on the other foot. They want to return the favor. And all this is why. Even if the blockade ends, nagorno karabakh will remain a regional flashpoint. One which may continue to be the epicenter of violence. One which may even find itself engulfed by another war. At this stage, though, we want to briefly zoom out to turn our attention away from Armenia and Azerbaijan and to the region more broadly. Specifically, we want to take a look at how the instability in this tiny slice of land is affecting three of the Caucasus' biggest players, Turkey, Iran, and Russia. One of the weirdest things about being a peace negotiator for Armenia or Azerbaijan must be the feeling that you're living in Groundhog Day. That's because the South Caucasus currently have two identical sets of peace negotiations underway, one led by the European Union and another led by Russia. Of these, the EU's effort seems the most successful. Over six rounds of talks, Yerevan and Baku have agreed to topics as thorny as mutual recognition, finalizing the border between their nations, and are even discussing a controversial transport link that would cross Armenia's south to connect the main part of Azerbaijan with its Najavan exclave. On the Armenian side, things have gone even further, with Prime Minister Pashinyan hinting he's willing to give up claims on Nagorno-Karabakh in exchange for Azerbaijan protecting its President's rights. Evidently, the deal isn't there yet, or we wouldn't be making this video, but slow progress is being made, and the EU's process is at least keeping diplomacy alive. Which is why it must be so weird for negotiators to then have to go and do the same thing all over again in the Russian backed forum. Logically, it just makes no sense. But then, logic was never the point. Moscow's position is that the South Caucasus constitute its backyard. Any EU brokered peace would be infringing on its turf, so is therefore unacceptable. Yet this ignores the reality of what's happening. The reality that the Kremlin's influence is withering in the region like a neglected houseplant. A withering caused by one sole factor Putin's disastrous invasion of Ukraine. Now, to see what we mean, Look back just three short years to 2020 and the aftermath of the Second Nagorno-Karabakh War. Not only had Moscow brokered the peace agreement and put Russian boots on the ground to enforce it, but Vladimir Putin was also talking of building a new military base in Armenian-held territory and assuring Armenian refugees that they could return under Russian protection. Along with President Erdogan of Turkey, he had pushed Western powers out of the region. Now, the future of Nagorno-Karabakh would be decided not in Washington or Brussels, but in Ankara. And Moscow. And then came 2022 and the Ukraine war. To debate whether Russia is currently losing or just about holding on is beside the point. By every metric, the Russian military has had a disastrous 18 months. Open source analyst Oryx list over 2,300 confirmed tank losses on Moscow's side. A June 2023 statistical analysis by independent Russian outlet Medusa estimated at least 47,000 troop deaths with tens of thousands more wounded. These are staggering numbers. 
and they are almost certainly behind the collapse of Russia's broader authority. When Armenia asked the CSTO for help in 2022 and Russia did nothing, it didn't just give Azerbaijan the green light to step up its hybrid warfare, it also drove Yerevan to take steps that would have once been unthinkable. Armenia, remember, isn't just one of Russia's allies, it's one of its key allies, the only CSTO state to help Russia in its intervention in Syria, albeit in a non-combat role. One of just five member states of Putin's cherished Eurasian economic union. Since the CSTO's 2022 failure, though, Yerevan hasn't been so much drifting away as running full pelt for the exit. This year alone, Prime Minister Pashinyan has cancelled joint CSTO drills, told reporters, quote, We are not Russia's ally in the war with Ukraine, and made steps to join the International Criminal Court, a move that would see Yerevan treaty bound to arrest Putin if he ever sets foot on Armenian soil. This September, Armenia even sent humanitarian assistance to Ukraine, causing a diplomatic row. But nothing compares to what's happening as we record this video. From the 11th of September up to the 20th, Armenia is running joint military drills with the US Army, drills designed to get Armenia's military up to NATO standards. Make no mistake, this is a slap in Putin's face, and a very <laughs> deliberate slap at that. A calculated protest to a so-called ally that abandoned Yerevan in its hour of need. But it's also about something deeper, a sign that the geopolitics of the South Caucasus are fundamentally shifting. Prime Minister Pashinyan has been open that he thinks Russia is disengaging from the region, telling an Italian magazine as much on September the 5th. That means Armenia is now scrabbling to forge new alliances. While the EU is becoming active in the region, it's also a major buyer of Azeri gas. Hence why Yerevan is inching even closer toward Uncle Sam. A move Washington, hoping to isolate Russia, is trying to encourage. However, it's not quite as simple as Armenia just saying, OK, we're bros in America now. Cool. To understand why, we need to look to another regional power, one which stands to lose out massively if this crisis unfolds the wrong way. A power that most Americans would consider their sworn enemy. And we're talking, of course, about Iran. A Pentagon plan is hoping to prize Armenia away from Moscow. Perhaps the biggest complication is that Russia is not the only geopolitical foe Yerevan is friends with. Armenia also maintains important links with its southern neighbor Iran. And while it may be an alliance of convenience against Turkey and Azerbaijan, it's also one with deep roots. Speaking to our monitor, Deputy Foreign Minister Vahan Kostanyan recently declared that, quote, the border with Iran is of utmost importance to us. We have two closed borders with Turkey and Azerbaijan, thus Iran and Georgia are our only gates to the outside world. But while the Iran connection might be awkward for America, it's not what we want to analyze in this part of the video. Instead, uh, we want to turn our attention to something that's less broadly covered in the media. How an Azeri victory in Nagorno-Karabakh could be a disaster for Tehran. Our monitor recently did an interesting deep dive into one of Baku's main geopolitical goals, to create a road and rail corridor connecting the Azerbaijani mainland with its exclave of Nakhichevan. If you look at a map, you'll see that these two parts of Azeri territory are separated by Armenia's southernmost point, the province of Sunik. Therefore, any land bridge would have to cross here, presumably along the southern border. Unfortunately for Tehran, that border is also the only land link between Iran and Armenia. If Azeri forces control it, then the Islamic Republic loses a vital connection, not just to an ally, but to Western markets. As a visiting fellow at Berlin-based think tank SWP told our monitor, this quote would be a geopolitical catastrophe for Iran. On the flip side, it would be a massive win for another regional power, Turkey. Ankara's only border with Azerbaijan is at the very northern tip of Nakhichevan. With the land corridor in place, though, Turkey would be able to export goods through its ally to lucrative Central Asian markets, something it currently has to rely on Iran for. Of course, such a link wouldn't run from or through Nagorno-Karabakh, but we mention it here because it is intimately tied to what happens in the self-governing region. One of Baku's main goals, the land bridge, is something Azerbaijan is negotiating for right now. Pressure on Nagorno-Karabakh might be one of the ways to get Armenia to accept its position on the subject. But the bigger reason is that Tehran's interest in the border shows just how dangerous the Third Nagorno-Karabakh war could be, how a final Azeri play for victory might drag in not just Baku and Yerevan, but also Turkey and Iran. Already this year, Azeri and Iranian forces have conducted military exercises along one another's borders. President Aliyev has said that, quote, relations between Azerbaijan and Iran are at the lowest level ever. 
It doesn't take a genius to see how an Iran that fears a geopolitical catastrophe should Armenia lose another war might be tempted to intervene. Nor is it hard to imagine Turkey responding to that intervention on the side of its ally, Azerbaijan. And if Iran and Turkey were to get dragged into a South Caucasus conflict, well, let's just say it would make the Nagorno-Karabakh war look rather tame in comparison. Now, we should stress here that there's nothing inevitable about renewed conflict. It could be that European diplomacy yet bears fruit. It could be that President Aliyev calculates he's gotten as many concessions out of Armenia as is currently possible and turns down the pressure. But there are signs that another conflagration could be brewing. Today, Armenia's traditional ally Russia is weakened and distracted. While Yerevan is turning to the US, it's not like Uncle Sam would deploy troops to protect Nagorno-Karabakh. Some analysts therefore think Aliyev might feel he needs to act now or lose his window of opportunity. That this may be his only chance to complete a clean conquest of the breakaway region and establish a lasting Azeri victory. Already this September, there have been reports of troop buildups along the line of contact, worrying signs that Aliyev might be hoping to finish what his forces started in 2020. Yet even if the final confrontation never comes, this is still a region that's worth paying attention to. As we've hopefully shown in today's video, tiny Nagorno-Karabakh is a place where the fates of regional powers can be determined, where the futures of nations as significant as Russia, Iran, or Turkey may be decided. But it's also something else. A place where tens of thousands of Armenians are suffering, their pain widely ignored by the outside world. A place where acts of cruelty like the blockade are being perpetrated in plain sight under the clear mountain skies. It may not be as well known as Ukraine or Haiti or Yemen, but Nagorno-Karabakh and her people deserve our attention. The least we can do is acknowledge their suffering and its significance for all of us.